All right. Well, welcome everybody to tonight's special uh, USAV webinar. We've got featuring Eric Hodgson from our Arizona region of USA Volleyball. Where what is your title down there, Eric? Director of Outreach. Outreach. Yes, I like it. Yeah. It's even better than sport development. Outreach. Um, and we're going to talk about the things that he and uh, USA Volleyball we've been learning over the last four years, but Eric learned it uh, firsthand and then shared this with his Arizona region and is kind enough tonight to share it with everybody else that is uh, online. So without further ado, you just are going to need to tell me when to click, okay? And I'm going to, I'll do that for you. Um, oh. That's uh, you know, a pretty easy thing. But I guess. I guess click. Yeah. Take it away. Well, I guess click. Let's let's uh, we'll plow in. Do you see your dream vacation? I do not. Hold on. Let okay, me see. it's up on my screen. Let me see what audience view is. No, audience view isn't showing my what I see on my screen. So we've got our first go-to meeting challenge. <laughs> uh, I'm showing the Growing the Game Together webinar title page. Yeah, I, I'm seeing the audience you show on that and not what I'm... Oh, there we go. All right, E-Man, talk to us about your dream vacation. Okay, well, just so you know, I'm still seeing the same slide, but okay. Um, really? Wow, the dream vacation was... Uh, just check. Yeah, it's in the same thing. Could be me though. I'm, oh no, there it is. Gotcha. Okay. Um, now there was just a confluence of events that happened within four or five days of each other, and within you know a six-hour drive for me, so I decided to abandon the family for a weekend and uh, did the the uh, AV State Coaches Convention at uh, at USC on the fourth and the fifth, and then the night of the fifth, uh, went and saw the men's national championship match between uh, Irvine and USC, and. Uh, people in the arena and so it was pretty gnarly and uh, on May 6th uh, a friend of mine who was running a youth tournament and wanted me to come down and see it was very developmental it was uh, 12 and unders they were basically there was 14 and 15 year olds officiating and parents were <laughs> parents were in control of themselves they had serving from the that they got to serve they took steps back and got to serve goal, and it was very developmental, and it was fun to watch. And uh, then drove back up to Long Beach on the morning of the 7th and went to the men's national team practice and watched uh, Trinidad Tobago practice and also Canada practice. And then that night went to uh, dinner with Nicole Davis, the national team libero, and uh, then went to the, the men's national team, first time I'd ever seen him in person, um, at Long Beach, and they uh, beat up on Trinidad Tobago. And then the next morning, I went to Anaheim and uh, watched the women's national team practice with uh, Hugh and, and Marv and uh, Tom Black and everybody. And of course, Paul and Karch were there, and the whole, all 25 national team members were there and did some interviews there for our region newsletters and web page and uh, drove home that afternoon. So it was a condensed vacation, but it was awesome. So, All right. So... And I can see why that was a, a dream vacation. Um, we've got why model the national teams up on the screen. Okay. Well, um, Maybe you're too far down. I think obviously are. The, uh, well, for obvious reasons, I mean, we had a lot of success in 2008, and I think we're looking at a lot of success. 2012, and, and uh, you know, although the although the men does look like the men are going to have a uh, a medalist this year, there's two women's teams in contention on the beach, and of course our men's indoor and women's indoor, uh, both in the thick of it. So you know that we seem to be doing something right. And I can add in that the uh, the USA Paralympic sitting women's team is ranked number two in the world, and. I head over to London on the uh, 26th and come back in late mid-September, I guess, and and they're doing everything they can within the stuff that Eric is going to share with you to to uh, see if they can beat China, who trains 50 weeks a year, 
if you watch their divers and their table tennis players and their badminton players, you can see what that amount of training over the years does. Um, our kids in sitting volleyball, they they have real jobs and a life, and and they don't they do other things other than sitting volleyball. Yet we're crossing fingers we're going to be able to beat them. So, so where's the disconnect? Yeah, this this has been a big I think pet peeve of ours like for a long time. You know that I, I'll I'll go. I've been doing camps all summer, and so I've one of these camps, and routinely there's three or four teams of 30, 40, 50 kids in these gyms. And, and I'll ask them if they can name just once on the women's national team. And, and up until the first week or last week in July, um, five camps, I had zero. And no, nobody, none of the kids could answer that question. And I asked the same thing in the men's team, and there was no answer. And so the, the question comes, you know, I, you know, well, do you know who Babe Ruth and Michael Jordan are? And, and you know, well, they don't play professional baseball, and they don't, you know, they might follow baseball, but they don't know it and these guys these kids are playing their sport and don't know anybody about it so you know ask them who's paula weissop or karch grant they don't know so that was a big thing so at the last at the last five camps i, I was having them um i took a little about 10 or 15 minutes out of camp time and i told them gave them a name of a national team player on the men's or the women's side and or a coach and they had to come back and give a little you know minute or two presentation just so they kind of knew and it was kind of neat because I actually got an email back two days ago from one of the kids or one of the kids that I had done a camp with in South Carolina or in Georgia I'm sorry in Savannah Georgia who said that it's the first time she'd ever watched a full match she her report was on Destiny Hooker and she was so excited to see Hooker's name in the paper and on the website and saw her play and she was really excited and told them all about it so that's the kind of thing I think we need to do more of um, as volleyball coaches is we need to expand our sport and, and let these kids know about the legends and the, the budding legends and the legends that are being created right now. You know, um, I couldn't agree more. And I, Indianapolis was where I was yesterday evening, uh, or actually Sunday, so that was Saturday. And Jean Kirstensen from uh, the area around Indianapolis, she sent the team from her camp as part of the camp project. For like a they made a, um, who's that type? Is that you, Eric, Mr. Typist? Yeah, you are. You're typing away, Barry. <laughs> Sorry. Couldn't <laughs> um, <laughs> Gene did a film where all the kids learned their names and said their names to the, and wished good luck to the, uh, to the players and then sent the, the video to Tom Pingle and we sent it on to, you know, to the team, the show to the team. So, um, Another idea for four years out, maybe we can do a little bit better job of that too, as well as wish some of our, our World Cup teams or our Grand Prix teams some good luck and things. All right, you've got Alex Kleinman up on the screen now. Yeah, and you know, so when I was at the women's national team practice, like I said, I did some interviews for our, our I work with the Arizona region and do newsletters and website stuff. And so I talked to Alex and, and uh, you know, this was this was week two of the training block, and just so to give you an idea, week one, pretty much all the athletes were involved in, in the drills, and week two, it started to get pared down, and I think it became obvious to a, a couple, to some of the athletes, you know, who who was going to be, you know, probably not going to make the Olympic team and who was, although they wound up taking everybody to Grand Prix, which is nice, but Alex is one of the ones that I sat down with and chatted with her for about 10 minutes, and you go to the next slide. She, you know, she was... She was. She, I think she understood. She understood that she was the youngest player in the gym, and uh, and and she knew she was kind of fighting an uphill battle. There was a lot of, you know, so much talent in that gym, and she, her being the youngest player, and she really only had about two and a half, three years of experience with that national team, and hadn't hadn't gone to some of the bigger tournaments. So she knew. But you know, the nice thing was when I asked her one of the questions, I said, "Well, what was the best advice you ever got?" And uh, and she basically said, you know, her dad told her, "Just go out." every single day, every single practice, when you feel good, you feel bad, and just do the absolute best you can, and you got to walk away knowing that was the best you could do, and it was funny because after I had chatted with her, I went over to the whiteboard where they had just done an outside hitters tournament, and, you know, guess who won? Alex had won, so, you know, she still, even knowing she probably wasn't going to London, she still gave her best and, and won the outside hitters tournament, beat Kim Glass and Megan Hodge and everybody else, so it was pretty impressive. Yeah, you know, 
I've been getting several dozen letters from kids that uh, are now asking, how do I make the Olympic team? Average age is probably 14-year-old kids sending us notes, how do I make the team? And the way I respond is to let them understand Olympism. And I want them to know what Citius Altius Fortius is, which is uh, swifter, higher, stronger. And that whole point of that in my email back to them, in addition to saying play doubles, so you get a lot of reps and, and uh, you know, pursue your passion and a few other things, is what Olympism is. And if you go to the IOC.org website, you'll find a button on Olympism. And that's sort of a way of life of being the best you can be every day uh, in that term of swifter, higher, stronger. So I totally agree and think that uh, Hugh's done a pretty good job of, and Alan both, of instilling that attitude in the top players for sure. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, okay. So you said Alex said that, and that's what this slide's about. So. Yeah, yeah. All right, Reed. Yep. Yeah, so I chatted with Reed Pretty for a long, long time. And one of the things, you can go to the next slide, John. Um, it says it's, you uh, just don't you know win. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can go to the next slide. The next slide, if you, again, I don't know. If, I, I don't, yeah, that, this is a couple of pictures of Reed. And, and uh, if you go to his website, which I think is reedpretty.com, there's some pretty interesting video there. Um, I don't think we need to show it here, but uh, just, you know, this is Reed's third Olympics, I think, and, uh, you know, in, in 2008, um, he was talking about, or 2000, I think it was 2000, actually, when he was first getting on with the national team. Like he says, we were a young team, and, and he wasn't necessarily sought after recruit and, you know, one of the blue chip guys, but he's had a couple of really tough losses, and Doug Beal at the time went up, and he said, you know, Reed, you don't just get to win. And he says, it's not a right. You're not entitled to it. And he's and, and Reed made a point of bringing that up, saying, you know, in, in this day and age, there's a lot of kids that think that they're entitled to winning, and and just because they pay club dues or just because they're you know they're good or or whatever. And he said it just it doesn't work that way. You know, he said the guys like he says on the other side of the net want to win just as bad or even more sometimes. And so he really that was his that was his turnaround. He said he he started really really working hard and. So when you see Reed in the gym and you see him at practice and stuff, his you know he takes incredible care of his body, which is you know start you know started to creep creep up mid thirties and and uh, um, he he just he's a consummate professional. He understands the the big picture and he you know plays professionally and he gets it. You know he just gets it. But like he said, it's it's not going to be handed to you. And he said that was that was the most important advice he ever got in his entire playing career. So. So then something happened to Reed health-wise in a pretty unique way. I've never heard of it happening before or since. Yeah. So as you guys can read, he was, he was, uh, they were swing blocking and, and uh, I believe it was Max Holt, uh, his left elbow came down on Reed's face and, and pretty much knocked him clear off the net. And uh, as you can read, he had some, some major trauma, facial trauma. And, um, and then woke up from that surgery, and then um, had another arterial artery break, and uh, and started to fill his eye, and so he had to go back into surgery right away. So we had you know two surgeries, uh, pretty much within hours of each other. So um, it was it was as he puts it, it was pretty gnarly. So some of the pictures coming up, if you're a little squeamish, you may want to look away. But um, <laughs> there's some X-ray photos and a nice black eye photo. But I don't know. But you can see the breaks that he had. And uh, he wound up wearing a mask and went back to Russia and played. And actually, his team won the, uh, the uh, Russian championship. Um, so, I mean, he came kind of full circle. So, And, you know, I think it goes without mention. Uh, the people, a lot of people don't know what happened to you this in this last year, but if you go to the Grow the Game Together blog, I think you put a great story together about, you know, your sort of brush with death um, called, what's it about, the game or something? The randomness of the game, isn't that what you call it? Yeah, the randomness I think so. Of life. Yeah. 
Yeah, take a look at the uh, one that says um, guest blog by Eric Hodgson on the Grow the Game Together area because uh, a story worth reading and reminding yourself out about as a coach. So then you got a chance to spend some time with you. Yeah, so I, you know, obviously we're watching Hugh in the uh, in the practice, and I tried to get him after practice, but he actually had an appointment, and we traded phone calls for about a week, and then finally he texted me one afternoon and said, "Okay, give me a call now." And we chatted for probably about I don't know half an hour or forty minutes, and we chatted about a lot of stuff. And you know, I I just can't speak more highly of Hugh. You know, I'm I'm a coach, and I've been a coach for a while. And, this guy literally is just on a different plane than than everyone else, and it, and it explains why you know they're knocking on the door of a gold medal. Um, he just again, if you want to click on click on this, this he talks a little bit at the 2010 World League about um, you know his team and, and what they what they accomplished and, and how he kind of sees things. You don't have to play the whole thing, but the first I don't know 10, 12 minutes, not 10 minutes, but a couple minutes are pretty interesting. The favorites, and you, you, you made a good job in the first and the second group. Yeah, are you satisfied? Uh, yeah, I think we're doing okay. Uh, it's, um, I, I think people probably forget we have many young and experienced. Well, I don't know how's it playing out there because GoToMeeting is not designed for, for videos. Can you hear it okay? Yeah, it's really choppy. We should let's just skip it because yeah. a lot of what he talks about just comes in the upcoming. Well, slides, and so everybody that's we'll taken see. this, whether it's live or you're watching the recording, there's the link, and uh, worth yeah. worth listening in for sure. So about the culture. So this was the most interesting thing, you know, going into that practice. You know, like I said, I, Hugh has a certain way of coaching, and and when you. I've probably heard Hugh he, he speak now, I don't know, five, six, seven times. And his, he pretty much has the same mentality that, you know what, we're just going to get a little bit better today than we were yesterday. And that's his whole mentality is a little bit better today, a little bit better today. And um, But he definitely holds athletes accountable. And he understands that there was this gym with 25 girls in it. And these were 25 of literally the best players in the world, not just in America, but even the girls we cut. I, I don't know if you'd agree with this, John, but I even say the girls that got cut from the Olympic team could probably start on any other country's team in the world, or pretty darn close. Yeah, pretty darn so close. He had an yeah, he had an amazingly talented gym, and, and he knew it, and he had to figure out a way to kind of get everybody to buy into what, it, what, his, what his, you know, gym culture was, and that was that everybody's making everybody a little bit better, and so when you started looking at, you know, at the, at the players during practice, there was no clicks, there was no two people always talking or going off. It, it was everybody talking with everybody at one point. Um, at one point, I want to say it was, it was uh, Kristen Richards um, had a couple, had, they had her, they were doing some service seat drill and she had a couple of rough outings and, you know, instead of going off and pouting, she went up to Nicole Davis, the, the libero, and said, hey, get, you know, what do I need to do here? Tell me what to do. And Nicole helped her without hesitation. And so all these girls were in competition with each other, but at the same time, um, knew that there was a bigger common goal, and so that's exactly how the culture was in that gym. It was uh, there wasn't a lot of talk from the coaches. The specific the feedback was really really specific. No, I mean I was in there for almost four hours, and I didn't hear a coach raise their voice once. Um, the talk on the court was between the girls was just loud and encouraging. Um, it was interesting that when a mistake was made, you know they would just uh, you know, they would kind of come together and and uh, and put their uh, put their hands up and um, when there was a point they would put their hands and, and then they'd hug each other and so it was kind of every time they came together and um, it was just like I said it was just kind of refreshing it was one of the things I had asked him was you know was can this mentality work in club or work at a high school when you have you know parents looking out for their own interests and college coaches looking out for their own interests and and club directors and club coaches looking out for their own interests at times. And he said, you know what, you have to sell it, but absolutely it can work at any level. And so it was it was it was pretty neat. You have to sell it. That's uh that's part of where Hugh comes from for sure. Um yeah. this is a little bit more about that same stuff about drill speed and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See it was uh the the you know the drills were obviously play, being played at a really high level. These are these are 25 girls competing for 12 spots, and you know and if you think about it, they're 
these 25 girls have probably never been cut from anything in their lives. They've never not made a team. They've always been the best and the brightest and the most athletic. And, and so, you know, that they knew they were competing for these spots and they played like it. And um, it was, you know, the, the team at the end of the drill, you know, the end of the drill, they started this drill and I want to say it was 11, probably 11.15, maybe 11 o'clock. The drill finally ended around 20 after after 12. The team come together, comes together and you told him on the last play, you know, let the last play go and, and be ready for the next ball. And then as he left, he said, they'll work on it and they'll get better tomorrow. And they did their cheer and they left, you know, well, some of them left. So, so yeah, Eric, it's just an amazing culture. Tell me, um, when you say drill I, and you have 25 kids, what you mean by drill? Is it a six-on-six six, uh, scored it was a, thing? It, it was an outside hitters tournament. And so what they basically did was rotate setters with each outside hitter um, against different defenses and different liberos. A couple of the girls, I think, had they had medical issues, so they sat out. And then I know, I think Logan and Jordan and, and Lindsay all went and lifted at the time after the first round was over because they all had interviews or something to do after, so he was trying to manage all that as well. But, every, but it was literally everybody was involved in, in the drill for the most part, and if they weren't, they were off working with, uh, you know, Tom Black was there, and he was doing some stuff with Stacy Sakura um, on passing. And um, you know, when when Alicia and Courtney were kind of going in and out, uh, you know, they would work with other coaches. I mean, it, there was everybody was busy. Nobody was standing around. Everybody was busy the entire time. And were the hitters hitting against a block or no block? No, absolutely a block every time, and a, obviously a huge block, fluke, and you know, and, <laughs> and so yeah, every time. Yeah, that's pretty game like. Um, what about serving? What was the serving training that you saw in this four-hour period? Well, one of the first drills that they did was a was a service serving passing kind of a thing where they actually they would serve, then it came to pass, and then the uh, they had one other player that would set back to whoever passed the ball, and then they had to hit it, and, you know, and, and put it down, and. Um, you know, so that went on for probably 15 or 20 minutes. But I remember at one point, her Hugh kind of walked by one of the courts, and he and he looked at him, and he said, you know, because I, I think he thought they were serving a little light, and he looked at him, and he said, get after it. And the next thing you know, the balls were just screaming over the net. So, I mean, they they were, I mean, they I think the point they started to maybe ease up a little bit, he went, he got right after him and just pushed him to that next level. So, um, this is what he was talking about, how to develop your culture, and he just says it's a, you know, this is a really good quote, I thought, that it's a function of the vision you have for the program and the goals you set as a leader. And he is an amazingly consistent coach. Um, I, I think that he oftentimes, um, you know, has to deal, he often talks about this, that there's, you can't, you have to be consistent, but you can't deal with every player the same way. And so he's got 25 different personalities that he juggles and manages, you, you know, so well. And it's you know, and, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find any of those girls, whether they made the team or got cut, that can't find great things to say about Hugh. I, I've yeah, I've never heard anybody say anything bad about Hugh as a coach ever. So that was his thing: create the vision, invest in it, and be passionate about it. And then he said, "Live it." And that was his. That was how you develop your gym culture. And if you're a, a new coach and you haven't had a chance to hear this out of impact, um, you know, 25 years ago when I was flying back with. Marv Dunphy, our gold medal victory in hand from Seoul, Korea. I was writing the first impact manual, and I said, um, I've got to do this impact manual. And you did your thesis on John Wooden. In 25 words or less, what did you learn about John Wooden after 100 hours of interviews and your whole PhD thesis on the guy? Marv, you know, you're standing up in the bulkhead back then, you know, pre 9-11 days, and he said, John, you know, I, I don't need 25 words to a new coach. I would tell him one thing. The thing I learned from John Wooden's, my thesis on John Wooden was to be consistent. He, he was, and if you don't know who John Wooden is, Google him, but the winningest <laughs> <laughs> basketball coach out there in history, NC2AY/slash. slash Probably the best teacher in ESPN magazine ranked him as the number one coach in the history of any sport. And his books and his material are 
totally transferable to volleyball. And that's why Marv Dunphy did his thesis on him, our gold medal volleyball coach from 88. And I think that's one of the things any age, 12 or 22 or 122, <laughs> the, the athletes that are playing, they you got to be that's good, me. you know, or else they don't know which Dr. Jekyll or Hyde coach is going to be showing up and they don't know what to rely on and they, they don't have confidence in you. Even though, as Eric said, with John Wooden, he says, I treat everybody fairly. I just don't treat them equally, but I treat them all fairly. That's his way of saying the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. So you got some more McCutcheonisms. Yeah, this is, you know, this is the stuff that you'll hear from McCutcheon every time he talks, you know, and he talks about the process and about getting better every day. Um, and my favorite quote, and I, I literally love this quote, is, you know, at, at the end of the day, there are a lot of little things, but there are no little things. And so, you know, if you, I'll give you a perfect example when at the beginning of the practice that I was at, you know, he, everybody comes to the board and, and he had a couple of housekeeping things. And one of the things, the next things he said was, you know, yesterday in practice, all the non-setters um, setting was awful. And he looked at all of them and he said, and yet not one of you guys was in here this morning working on it. And then he went to the next thing, and the girls kind of looked around at each other. And sure enough, after that practice was over, 1230-ish, um, I'd say, I want to say six six or seven other girls went over to a side court um, with one of the other coaches and started working on setting. And, you know, that's his little thing. There are, you know, there, there are no little things. Um, everything is important. Everything they do matters, every single thing. So um, that's the other one is we don't have to be great. We have to play good volleyball for extended periods of time. And then he talks about, as a, as a coach, you know, you uh, get a lot better at teaching, which is a critical component. And he says, if you'd rather, you know, if you have a choice, you'd rather be a better teacher than a coach. Because if you teach them the right way, hopefully they can go out there and just play and, and be fine on their own and hope you don't get in the way. So um, that's, I mean, that's you in a nutshell, I think. Great stuff and, and uh, parallels what we see in all great coaches and other sports. Um, got a couple more, including your pony quote. Yeah, and so, yeah, that's his favorite quote. It's not all rainbows and ponies. He loves that quote. But uh, and then again, this is what he was talking about. I think we some either I or somebody had asked him about you know the definition of a USA team, and this is what he said that there's a way of competing and a way of grinding it out. A volleyball IQ. We have a lot of players that know the game and know what's going on. And and then at the end, he says, I think you know those are the hallmarks of good USA teams. And I think you know that. That quote alone, I think, if you look at the women's and the men's team and the way they played this Olympics, I think that describes them in a nutshell. They really do battle and grind it out every single point. So it's it's been fun to watch. And uh, why isn't it all rainbow and ponies? <laughs> you know, sometimes, like like he says, sometimes you do everything right and you can still lose. You know, and and so it's you know things aren't. Things aren't always going to go your way, and you have to be willing to take that, learn from it, and, and move on. But you know, life's not always always rainbows and ponies. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it just a quick reminder that uh, for in every match played since the beginning of volleyball's creation under William G. Morgan in 1895, 50% of the teams lost. So, you know, if you're sometimes we forget that. I think. <laughs> We expect to win all the yeah. time, like you said earlier, and we expect to be winners, and you know, that, that's what the other side's thinking, too, and it, it, therefore yeah. sometimes the caca occurs. Yeah. All right, so practice efficiency slide. Uh, we, we love the slide here, of course, about uh, why keep practice a secret. Yeah, this, is, uh, this was one of the, one of the two uh, big women's boards that they had, and if you look at you know, this is what they were going to do, and they uh, they were looking at you know non-setter sets there, as you see in the third one down. Once again, what we was talking about some scramble setting. So this was all the stuff they were doing for warm up, and then if you look below that, that's that's all the stuff that they were going to be doing after practice. Um, and I think the next slide I want to say is the other board. Yeah, it's coming up. Yep, there it is. And so that was the they were doing partner series and then some serve receive stuff and then they're doing outside hitters tournaments so um, and you know so you can see everything 
was set up and so the girls never had to come ask a question they literally would go up to the get a drink go up to the board and go on the court and there was never you know the, the, the amazing thing or the nice thing is that the, the transition between drills is just seamless you know he, he stops a drill the girls go grab a, a quick water they come back and they're back on the court playing within minutes you know within a minute or two whereas I think it's you know a lot of times with younger coaches and even me that's something I still work on is is uh, you know, just how to get that next drill going without having to sit and explain it every single time and stuff. You know, you give it a name and and uh, get it going quickly and get it more touches. I mean, if you think about how much time is wasted at water breaks, going there and coming back and explaining and going, it's just you know you're you're losing hours and hours and hours of practice a season. So it was seamless though when he did it. So and if you look to the right, um, what we were talking about. Uh, there at the bottom where it says, you know, non-setter setting. That was, like I said, that was one of the last things he talked about, and he just was disappointed that no one had come in the gym to work on it beforehand, and sure enough, after that practice, like I said, six or seven girls went off to one of the side nets and started practicing. And uh, tell me, run, walk, not. Oh, it was, it's not what you think. They had done a, they were doing a cancer walk. Um, ah, Kristen, okay. Kristen's mom yeah, Kristen, uh, Kristen's mom had, had recently died, as you know, Lori, had died of cancer, breast cancer, and the girls all got together and wanted to do a, a, a cancer walk, and Nicole, I think Nicole, and I'm trying to remember who else was, were, oh, it was Nicole, and uh, uh, she can't remember who it was, but oh, it was Nancy Metcalf, and they had got together and put, the, put this walk together, but it was in the afternoon, and they had practice uh, later that afternoon. And so Hugh had said he didn't want to make it a compulsory thing that the girls had to do it. He let them decide if they wanted to do it. Yeah, so yeah. that's what he was saying. It's You don't have to do it. He said just make a good decision. If you feel comfortable, do it. But understand you have practice after. And so I want to say eight or nine of the girls did wind up walking. I know Nicole was one of them. So, yeah. So that's what that was. And what about dig off the net? He was uh, a little concerned that the passes that previous day um, had been really tight to the net. And so, like he said, he wanted to pull him off a little bit. And as he said, you know, during his, his warm-up time, he said, if you, you know, listen, if, if, if we want to push him up closer, we'll let you know. But right now we need to, we need to pull him off four or five feet off the net and, and run our offense from there. So, again, it's one of those things that as we, I think we're going to keep going, we talk about um, minimizing risk and, and uh, managing risk. And so we'll talk about that. I think that's under Karch's thing. So. All right. So. And this was, this was just some stuff. Yeah, this is just some stuff we, you know, we, we, he, you know, Hugh talks about, and a lot of coaches and you talk about. What, you, you should probably talk about this more than anything. Well, it, you know, the the cumulative effect as of what you had mentioned earlier about just water bottle examples, where if if yeah, I, the way I explain it is, if you got a team of identical twins, and the one team over here is running the same exact practice, but they run into the coach whenever the coach calls them and they run to shag balls and they run to uh, the next drill or whatever and chasing things that they're getting. I'm kind of surprised Hugh uses the word shag because um, he's from the mother mother England, you know, yeah. instead of retrieve or no. get the balls, but <laughs> I can relate yeah. to that. Yeah, no, that's that was me. That was oh, me using yeah. that word. So, <laughs> but, I, I was. This was presented to Arizona coaches. So, yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I, I just, I guess, for me, I've always not wanted your practice objectives and what's going on to be hidden in the holy clipboard or in the holy folding Manila book envelope type secret place of the coach but to be known by everybody and that's what this teaching is about uh, you know any great teacher you walk into their classroom and they've got one or more whiteboards and we walk into the gyms around the United States and we see no whiteboards time and time again so there's a lot of reasons to see a better teacher and one of them the easy to do is just look at a whiteboard and one of the things that I really liked to talk about was was the last one there, that first section. Does the technique change with the intensity of the drill? So, you know, as he was saying, for example, you know, you work on, I don't know, passing and, and things, and then suddenly you get in a game of Queens and, and the kids are having a blast, but does the technique fall apart when they start having fun? And if it does, then, 
you know, then you need to stop and, and get the technique back. And his point was how many opportunities are lost because coaches kind of turn their back on the queens when they should be giving as much feedback to that as they are anything else in practice. And, you know, just because kids are having fun or playing a game doesn't mean that, te that the intensity or the, or the technique should change. So I thought that was a really good point. I know that's something I work on a lot. And I would, I would take it to a, on a level that I think everybody listening in tonight can understand, and that is when they play queens, you're just sort of thrilled that they're hustling, when in reality, every point you ever play, you probably want your players to kind of be up a little bit nearer to the net for the uh, setter dump possibility and even the overpass. So on the first and second contact, we all expect our probably our right and left wing players at least, back row to come up. Uh, maybe all three, some coaches choose. And then when the ball gets set, especially a back row set like you'll see in Queen of the Court or speed ball, in a match, if that ball gets set, you expect your players to back up and play defense deeper. How deep? Totally again, up to you guys. That move is a move you expect to see every time the ball's on the other side of the net, every rally, all the entire time. And yet when we get into queens or speed ball, we see it vanish. <laughs> and you're losing both a, a game-like conditioning opportunity as well as you're, you're not, they're not paying attention to the technique that you expect them to do in the match itself. So I agree totally that we've got to keep coaching during queen of the court, not just let them seem like, uh, oh, God, they're, they're having a great time. Yeah. And then the other thing you talked about was just, you know, this is, Cart said the same thing, you know, you've almost, you know, kids are different now. You can't really sit down and, and or pull them aside at court and talk to them for five minutes about something. You need to keep the feedback quick. So, uh, you know, his, his thing was feedback and text. That's what kids listen to. That's what they understand. That's the, it's the only form of communication that has 100% reply rate. You know, big kids might say they don't read their parents' text, but of course they read their parents' text. And they just may not answer it, but they sure they sure read it. So, just you know, it, it keep it short. Um, you know, it, it, feedback is probably the most important skill in coaching. I, I don't know if you'd agree with that, John, but I, I think you know for the most part it is, and and it needs to be instant, and specific, and functional. It can't just be can't just be white noise, as we hear a lot of coaches talk about. So, yeah, no, it is. The research is pretty clear that I mean, this is the only place that. You know, you, you, as a coach, as a teacher, you present the goal. That's pretty important. You can't do the skill, but you can give this feedback. And, and I guess the only thing we start to say a lot more in, in impact in the last couple, three, three years is it's about feed forward, things that they can do in the next one, not a radio commentary or somebody TV commentary saying you did this. Well, great. I, there's a lot of things I do. What is it I should do in the next one? So we call that feed forward in that same four by four, we call it uh, uh, four words by or four, no more than four words per skill set and no more than four words long, which yeah. very much fits the uh, text mode, you know, of uh, short and very specific. So we like this a lot. And asking them questions. That had to be happening there a lot, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, for sure it did. Yeah. All right, so some other things to add to your gym. <laughs> I just, uh, you know, the radar gun just popped up here. I'm going over to Germany to do some camps and clinics, and I just made Heath go to the big house and bring me my radar gun back that I'd loaned to them for their <laughs> summer camps. I said, that's great, but, you know, I need it back because I'm going to go do my own summer camp. So thanks, give me my radar gun back. Oh, uh, yeah. I about to, 20 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I have mine in my bag when I do my summer camps. I have it everywhere I go, and uh, it's it's not only fun for the kids, but it's you know it's a valuable tool. It it absolutely can show you know improvement. Um, you know, we only we only really you know for us we only put a speed on a serve that they get in, so it's it's mindful that they've got to get the serve in. And uh, but it's good to see you know that they they need to know you know you tell somebody that play you know these Olympic guys are serving high 70s, low 80s. You know, they just can't believe it, and they're you know they're pounding 35, thinking that, that they're Olympians, and it's just a different animal. So, but you know that the video camera and the visual feedback system, and and I think you've done some uh, 
you know, you've done some of your blogs on this stuff recently. Yeah, the most recent one, Gary. On yeah, the most yeah. recent one I I did mention um, about the tools that are out there, Ubersense and Coach's Eye and Android's uh, mm -hmm. Cyclops, they call it. So that is in another blog that I'm mentioning Hugh on called Videos and Hugh McCutcheon and something else, oh my. Uh, went up uh, uh, went up on the 31st of July, so that's up on the USA Volleyball website. So we can kind of blow past the first two things, but talk about the last two. Yeah, one of the you know one of the things I see a lot, especially with the smaller schools and smaller clubs and things like that, is is they'll have six or eight volleyballs or maybe ten volleyballs. And I know a lot of times that you know the economy may may predicate that, but you know the more the more balls obviously you can get in the gym, is the more touches, the less time you're you're spending shagging and uh, the more time playing. And so I mean I I think that's really really valuable. And then um, you know USA Volleyball has has come up with a vendor that can get you uh, a rope with four small nets attached to it that you attach perpendicular to your own net and tie off at the ends of the gym and you can set up four mini courts for you know skill work or a little mini tournament you know, mini volleyball tournament um, I, I think there's a there's kind of a perception that it only can be used for little kids but like, I think you said even your club team uh, didn't they at 14 14s or 15s or something we're doing skill stuff over it many you know many games that you know, 14 to 15 year olds were having fun doing. Yeah, and we've shown it at the uh, HP camp and um, a blog that went up in July is called The Evolution of Volleyball Nets. The photos on how to make the right. wall attachments and everything are in this new blog. Plus, the uh, we will have a video on it. Um, we videotaped as we did two major gyms in here in Colorado to show how to put oh, cool. a, a cool. net system. But the blog evolution of a volleyball net has that and the ribbon I took the ribbon and I used the ribbon in Indianapolis and got the you know twice as many so that said well why why does the national team do that or how many nets do they have at a practice Eric the nets had or the national team the women's national team had two three four five four five up that they were using at one time <laughs> and the the men's national team was practicing though at uh, at Long Beach, but every team only had only got one hour practice uh, one hour practice on one net. So there was I think four courts that they were using there, and uh, so they were but they but that was also the game day. So they weren't you doing regular practice. They were basically just doing serve and pass stuff. So so when they go to the normal, they had five nets going. Yeah, because Anaheim Sports Center has twenty nets for them to use in the morning. And I'm sure there's times that there's been some speed doubles or some fun tournaments there during the course of the last four years that a lot of those nets get used. But that's why these four nets in a rope, and we're showing how to make them out of nets that you might have just sitting on the floor that are not working anymore, how to cannibalize and fix those and make them into four nets. So there's going to be quite a, a video out that will be free on USA Volleyball's website to help all programs do this and I I don't know if you're able to do this with your club Eric but one of the ways our sports gonna grow in the future is when we see more of our kids coaching littler kids the kids not in a summer camp like you're at but the kids actually coaching during their practices the way Japan does and some other countries and other sports too I I've, in this summer I've been working with some other sports but they see the same thing that the kids are giving back. And when I did that, you would have loved it. If the, you'll see an interview on this, Eric, um, and everybody listening in tonight. We did some interviews of the HP Select Kids as we did the drills that we're going to unveil for everybody and the um, skill sets that they play. And our future selects are all 11, 9 to uh, 12 years old, basically. And... They each talked about what they love about volleyball and stuff, and I loved it. This one kid from Honol from from the Big Island, I think he was from Hilo, but he was from Hawaii, and he he has already been coaching for three years, and he's nine years old. He goes wow, and they put up the net down the middle, uh, as you'll see in the evolution of volleyball nets. They're going to be putting up the net down the middle of their court, 
they put up four small courts for the kids. And this nine-year-old that's been playing for three years is coaching the kids that are seven, eight, and six years old, giving back to the sport because you're a better player if you teach. So we like it to see clubs do the same thing with their actual j junior kids or coaching. It's not a beach thing only. It's, a, it's an indoor thing. And that's why the free mini volleyball book and the free uh, coloring books and all those other things exist out there to, to help you do these things. So, all right. Well, that's great. Um, then you went and watched the men. And so we've got every contact yeah. oh, has sorry, value up on going. the screen. Yeah, and so that was, you know, again, in talking with uh, just Alan and I probably got to just brief chat with him, but, you know, he, he was adamant in saying, you know, we have a goal to make sure we approach every contact with the idea that it has significant value to the process we're going through, with sound, which is a really long way of just saying every contact has value. And so, again, that's a men's team talking about their process and, and their, you know, they had a, they had a rough quad, I think. I, I think most people would agree with that. They... You know, they underachieved in some tournaments, but, you know, here they are. They won their pool today, and uh, they'll be, you know, they, they're, what, three matches away from a gold medal. So they're they're there. They're right there. Yeah, and their World League uh, performance also shows how how uh, how they're peaking at the right time and and the, the being yeah. together, which they can't always be. I mean, everyone, we'd love to see all these guys come back and do a, tour like the gymnasts are doing all stuff but they're not going to do it they can't they leave after the olympics go home celebrate for two or three weeks and then in the fall they go back to their professional leagues to play overseas and make their biggest income and if they've got gold medal status that's going to be a lot more valuable but the the, the definite peaking of the men's team um taking first in their pool like the women did is part of what we've been talking about tonight and part of what we teach about an impact and cap and gold medal squared and all the great clinics. So, so those of you that don't want to look like, this is what I look like. Um, I'm working with some uh, <laughs> Paralympic uh, military guys, hopefuls in San Diego sometime. And we just love this quote from Alexander Trentor that the best teachers are those who, who show you where to look, but don't tell you what to see. And, and, in all the research we've got, uh, guided discovery is almost good as intrinsic learning, figuring it out yourself like you did with a bike, um, without a coach and without drilling or anything, you learn to ride the bike. But the best coaches give you hints without a rule. They, they tell you where to look without telling you. And in that process, the retention of what is being learned is vastly superior to the retention when it's explicit learning, as in you tell them what to do. And that's the big reason for that more than anything. It's not just about how you're practicing, but how you perform. And retention is a tremendously important part of, of, the, of what good teachers do and the kind of stuff Eric's been talking about here. So Marv's up on the screen right now with volleyball is not one size fits all. It hasn't come to you yet. Yeah, and so, you know, this is one of, there it is, yeah. So, you know, this is one of Mars' favorite quotes is volleyball is not one size fits all. And, and uh, I think the next slide actually, you know, Marv, the day I was there, Marv um, officially was added to the, to the uh, women's Olympic um, team that day. He was actually, you know, uh, Hugh introduced him as one of the assistant coaches and, that was going to go to London with the team. But uh, that quote, I think, is just an amazing quote. Giving anything but your absolute best effort is the ultimate risk because if you come up short, you have no excuses, but it's the only way to achieve greatness. That's that's just pure Marv right there. And, again, he's somebody that if you've never, ever been to a clinic that Marv teaches, I would urge you to fly the extra 100 yards, 100 miles, or pay the extra $100 or whatever it is because he really is – um, a, a brilliant mind, and he's just as he, he's the way he explains things and the way he gives feedback is is just phenomenal. So uh, for sure, I would I would go to any clinic he did. So we've got the the not one size fits all YouTube clips, and you know since we're gonna refrain from going to them, but uh, tell us about why you picked these three. 
Yeah, just, you know, well, one of them was, you know, Phil Dalhauser serving. And if you've ever seen Phil serve, I mean, he's goopy-footed. He's, he, you know, he's what all of us, we see our junior kids and we, oh, we got to fix him, we got to fix him. But, I mean, I think Todd's done pretty well. I mean, I, I don't think I complain. You know, this year he's probably not real happy, but, you know, he's got a Olympic gold medal and he's, you know, won over, what, half a million dollars in prize money. And he's goopy-footed when he serves. Um, if you've seen April Ross's serve receive, um, she's kind of, I don't even want to say karate kid-like, ninja-like, whatever. Her arms are out wide. She looks like kind of a bear getting ready to attack, and uh, she has a reason for it. She you know, it just takes away more of the court for her, but um, that's just how she receives serve. I, I would never teach one of my kids to do that, but it works for her. And then the bottom one was actually one of my uh, one of my players in, in my junior team last year. I was coached a 15s team, and, and Taylor, um, this really coachable great kid, was having trouble. I wanted her to extend her arms up. And when she said, I wanted her to end up like, like a Superman. And what happened was her arms kept flailing out. And I kept telling her, you've got to set straight. You know, super, end up like Superman, end up like Superman. And this went on for a good month. And then I thought to myself, this is such a coachable kid. There's something wrong. I'm missing something. And so I filmed her and then broke it down frame by frame, which is what this video is. And if you'll notice, her when she goes to set, her arms... <laughs> Her arms are just set like that. Her arms flail out. When you know you and I hold our arms straight, we look like we're being held up. Her arms look like a Y, and that's just how she's built. And I couldn't figure it out until I actually broke down the film frame by frame and realized that's just how her arms are. And so she was doing what I asked her to. It's just that her body didn't want to agree with me. So <laughs> you know, in the long run, I, I apologized to her and I, you know, and showed her the tape, and she didn't even realize that that she had that going on. So um, it was kind of a nice little moment, but. You know, that, like I said, it's it's not. She wasn't wrong. It's just that's that's how she has to set. That's where how her body where her body takes her. So, and while I would uh, agree with you, Eric, and not necessarily teach indoor players um, to serve receive by putting your arms out wide. That is a common beach tactic done to show the opponent that there's not many holes and seams even though there's only two of you because you're on an eight meter on a nine meter wide court and when you spread your arms out um, Natalie Cook and Terry Potter so I think were the first ones to make it popular and it makes it a little bit more complex of emotion so it would violate a principle that we might see done in indoor play but it's it's I understand why she's doing that and stuff so yeah interesting stuff for sure. Well, and she's, listen, she's in the Final Four in the Olympics. It's obviously doing something, you know, it's working. <laughs> yeah. So, she's pretty know. good at it. Yeah. So, yeah. I know Di Cole's oh, on tonight, but yeah, this is our LTAD, Long Term Athletic Development slide. All these kids are the same age from our HP Future Selects in, in um, the summer. And, Fred Sturm, our 92 and 96 coach, who's in the Olympic team, a 92 bronze medal is what he won. He's over in Denmark, and, and he does some great long-term athletic development studies. And the biggest thing I took out of his material uh, when I worked with him was the importance of keeping everybody you can because you don't know who's going to be great. And there are, there are stories and stories upon stories about kids who grew up later or played incredibly well later that many programs would have cut and we need to come up with ways that, and we're helping our regions and we would love to hear from you if you've got ways to keep USA Volleyball helping them stay members and stay involved in the sport rather than get cut at 14 at middle school or get cut at 16 when they don't make JV. Um, we did something similar with our resource CD here, Eric. I, I think we've talked about it before with uh, our District 11 school district and 90 to 100 kids come out for the team for 7th and 8th grade. And they cut down to 12 and 12, a 7th grade and an 8th grade team. And 75 kids go home. And so we trained the PE teachers and set up the double nets down the middle of the court. If there was only two courts, if they had three courts, we didn't have to do that. And 
a Monday team played and a Tuesday team that was the next kids trained and a Wednesday team, which is the next group of kids trained, representing their school and they played the other schools in the school district. And all of this added into, we had, they kept 60 kids playing. And the reason it was so important, I think, for you guys to understand that are listening to tonight's webinar is that that when the, vars the, the freshman team coach cut down to her 12 the next year, half of the kids she kept were kids that came from the Cut Kids program. They weren't playing every day. They were only playing one day a week, and they only played on a Saturday against the other Monday teams from the other schools. Monday being that you practice Monday copying what the seventh grade coach was doing. Tuesday's team did whatever the Tuesday coach was doing and copied that, you know, the Tuesday. There were no, no extra coaches. They were just given the chance to keep playing at no extra cost other than the cost of the t-shirt to represent the school. And we need to do more of that to keep them all playing um, so our pipeline remains really strong and stuff. So the next slide you've got is Dunphy and Wooden on Discipline that's coming up here. Um, yeah, and, and that was Mark, like you had said, he did his dissertation on uh, on John Wooden. And uh, so, you know, one of the things that he talked about with Wooden was, you know, Wood, Wooden's idea on discipline. And, and uh, you know, it needs to be done early and often. And, and this was back, you know, keep in mind, this is in the, you know, 50s and 60s. And, you know, so there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of the, uh, uh, what do we want to call it? the issues that kids have now in dealing with, and they, they, you know, getting them in trouble maybe a little little sooner than they might. But you know, his his thing was if there was discipline on the court that needed to be done, that needs to be done, and get it done early, and get it done often, and, and, and rein in the player. And, and uh, but I like one of the couple of things he said is you never bruise the dignity of the person being disciplined. And he and one of his my favorite ones is discipline is for someone, not to someone. You know, and and the end of it, he, he, you know, as Mar said, you know you have to have the courage to take care of bad behavior because it's too easy to let it get out of control because you have a good player and, and you don't want to sit on them. He said, but in the long run, they just get hurt. You know, they, they just get hurt farther along. So you know, that was that was his take on, on what Wooden was talking about. Very well said and a great point, um, especially when the season starts. You know, the things that you talk about in the first day or two those are going to be the best remembered stuff out of an entire season often and they and so set the tone early and and um, it'll make your jobs a lot easier talk to me about reading and it goes back to well it, I was going to throw this in really quick but it also goes back to what McCutcheon said about consistency you know if you're if you're going to set up rules you know by mid-season you can't just let them go by the wayside I think you lose credibility as a coach and as a leader and so that's again that kind of falls into that so um, yeah, I mean, you know, talking about carts, and, and, and you know, I say this, I, I heard carts talk about eight eight or nine years ago, and I heard him talk about five years ago, and then about three years ago, and then I heard him talk at the uh, ABCA convention. And uh, it's just remarkable how far he's come. He was, you know, he was a hammer and hauler. He didn't really have his, his uh, I would say, his, speak, you know, his speaking style and, and stuff together. And now when you listen to him, he's very polished. He's very good. He's his message is clear and it's on task and it's and it's really a joy and pleasure to listen to him. Um, and he talked a lot of you know he spent a whole time the whole time talking about reading. Um, not sure I don't remember what's on the next slide, John, but um, you know part of his thing um, is seeing the right things at the earliest possible time is the first thing you say. That's coming in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's there's the story. Al Skates talked about the story. Of, of, you know, when, when he was coaching Karch at UCLA, and uh, there was the there was the uh, five one defense where it was you know you go there 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 and Karch go get the ball uh, because Karch having played beach when he was a youngster with his father and, and growing up in that he was able to figure out what was going to happen before it happened and so this is part of what he talks about is recognized recalled structured patterns and, and visual encyclopedia files that he has. And, recognizing the developing play the earliest um, and, and basically I think I think as we go on here he talks about this you know every tenth of a second you can eliminate something that's going to happen on the volleyball court and so his point was 
that if you can put yourself in a position where 80% of the time, 80% of what's going to happen can work, then you're probably going to do very, very well. So this is, for example, you know, okay, where should I be looking? What should I be seeing? And, you know, it, it, this is the kind of the sequence he talks about is ball setter, ball hitter. The ball comes out of the passer's hands to the setter. Then you watch the setter and watch the ball coming out of the setter's hands. So you know where the ball's going. Most kids will stay with the ball. And his thing is look at the hitter. The hitter will tell you everything. Um, where, you know, he's, his, he even went so far as to say he looks at the, at the body parts. Are the legs kicking back or are they kind of flat, which leads, leads him to believe they won't hit hard. Uh, where's his wrist? Is the wrist bent way back? Are the thumbs up or the thumbs down? Um, you know, what are their tendencies? Again, every tenth of a second, the options are reduced. So his point is putting yourself in a position with 80% chance of what's happening um, makes you a very good defender. And, you know, like you said, sometimes you're going to be wrong. Sometimes that setter will fool you, or sometimes that middle will shank a ball off their hand and, and uh, get a kill going the other way. But, you know, 80% of the time, uh, you're going to be pretty successful. So. All right. So what's up now is help your team read what's next. Um, yeah. And so that was his thing was how do I make the ball come to me? If I didn't, then I didn't do a very good job. So. Put yourself in a position to play the ball, and I think you know a lot of times we get caught up in stru these structured defenses, and you know have players standing right behind each other. Or I, I just had this happen at a, at a clinic I was at in Arkansas last this weekend, where we were playing, and a girl got set literally seven feet off to the side of the pin, of the right side pin, and yet the blocker stood at the pin, not realizing that there was no possible way the ball could get, you know, unless there was some sort of lightning bolt or sudden fan was turned on in the gym, the ball was going to kind of go around the pin, but she stood right there. And so, you know, it, it, those are the kind of things that as players, you know, we have to kind of say, listen, you, you got to think a little bit, you got to read what's happening and not just, you know, not just become this robot. You know, that's not how the game's played. It's, it's played, it's a fluid game and, and uh, you know, not to say you shouldn't be disciplined, but uh, you know, that's common sense. The ball's not going to be able to come back and, and, and get anywhere close to you. So we want you to be, you know, at least be in the play, at least be effective. So so what does the video show? Um, that video is, as I recall, of some sand players. Uh, no, actually what it is, I take that back. It's our high school, it's our, it's our uh, boys high school final. And I think what we were talking about was just showing, we were showing in the clinic that I did just, you know, trying to stop the stop action and say, okay, what's going to happen next? And actually, actually asking the coaches to read if they knew. And if, you'd be surprised how many had no idea what we were talking about. Right. They were just they were all about the skills and didn't understand the reading part of the game, which is sad and frustrating. But I mean, it's it's that's why we're here. That's why we're trying to do it better. So that's right. So tied into the yeah. uh, blog is this slide, and and uh, we don't need to go into this one anymore. So. The next slide is popped up is about Stacy. Yeah, this was, you know, I, I've known Stacy for a while, and uh, I, I don't know if we have to go through the whole story. Well, we are going to go through the whole story, but, you know, she, I had interviewed her on the Tuesday that I was at the national team practice, and she had, she had sort of basically just found out that she probably wasn't going to make the Olympic team because she had been left out a couple of drills on the second day. And this is a girl who literally has sustained excellence in our sport for 10 years, which is pretty amazing in itself, playing year-round for the most part. This is some of the stuff that she's, you know, some of the awards that she's received. And, you know, 2000, 2008, she was a silver medalist, you know, for the, for the women's Olympic team. And she's had, I want to say she's had four national team coaches, I think. Is that right? Three or four for sure. And so trained under Hugh the whole time. And, uh, and that video at the bottom is just a little highlight clip of her, which is really, really fun to watch. But um, what happened to her, obviously, if you don't know, is, is she was uh, in an accident. Uh, it's coming in. accident in Brazil. Yeah, about a, you know, about a year and four months ago, um, the bus that she was traveling, she was sitting on the, on the lap of a teammate and a bus that they were, uh, that they were taking uh, to their site. Uh, fell off the side of a, of a road in, the, in some rain and she wound up flying out. And um, I think they, they actually found her in a pool of water. They picked her up and um, a passing motorist just by chance happened to be coming by and saw it. And she was clearly the most shaken up of anybody. So they put her in the back of, the, of this guy's car and drove her to the hospital. And on the way to the hospital, um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that she, her brain began to swell. 
and she lost consciousness and uh, and lapsed into a coma, and um, it was in critical condition. And I mean, they were friends and relatives were told that she may not survive. I know her mom and her sister were called, and and uh, they you know the doctors did induce a coma, and they were you know like I said decided to remove the tube after science has showed that the swelling of her brain had decreased and so thank goodness for that because I know even USA Volleyball was a little unaware I think the first two days of just how serious it was and uh, then I think we got, an, we got a message from Doug just letting us know hey this is kind of a serious thing and um, you know she was in intensive care for 11 days I think on the fourth or fifth day she woke up and said yeah I can speak Portuguese so uh, but, but you know this is 13 months after actually it's now been 15 months I want to say um, you know, this is what she told me. Every day is a challenge, and I've never gone through this, and a lot of people haven't either. And, and you know, it was a tough, tough road. But it's, but she's trying to stay positive, and that was the biggest thing: is just, just trying to stay positive. And you know, again, you can go online, and I want to say there's some stuff on YouTube about Stacy's visual um, training. Her body has come back, but what was unfortunate is that her vision. She's had, she's had trouble tracking the ball since the incident and I'm not really sure how if I can explain this right but you and I our eyes move at the same time on something passing or coming towards us her eyes move in like chunks of information so she really it's really difficult for her to track a ball and so when I asked her about her vision she said I wake up every morning thinking you know thinking about it I think it gets better and I come to the volleyball court and well tomorrow you know and so when our interview was over, I, you know, I gave her a hug and I talked to her a little bit longer and she said, you know, last night, was, this was the first, so Monday night was the night that she had kind of realized that she probably wasn't going to make this team, that, that she had been left out of some drills. And uh, she said, I, I walked around my neighborhood and I said, well, for how long? And she said, four hours. And I was like, wow. And she said, I came to the conclusion that um, win or lose, go to the Olympics or not, I'm not going to let those two weeks define 34 years. She said, I've had three two weeks, meaning she's been in three Olympics, and she said, for me now, it's the journey in helping USA Volleyball gets better, which is, again, goes back to Hugh's mentality of everybody making everybody better in the gym, and I just thought that was a remarkable thing to say. So she's a remarkable woman for sure. And then there's our Arizona high school kid friend, 3A champion. Uh, what else was she? Uh, state champion and MVP in the 3A, Laura Webster. Yep. Yeah, so I've known Laura for a long time, and, and you know, Laura was, I think, go to the next slide, and talks a little bit about um, what she went through uh, when she was younger. She, uh, when she was 11, she had uh, OCR sarcoma, a form of bone cancer in her left tibia, and the, the, the bone was removed in a procedure called a rotation plastic, where they basically take her leg and, and rotate it backwards. Um, 180 degrees and connected to the remnants of the femur. So what it does is it basically allows her to have a, you know, she's got a full leg, but then she's got, a, you know, half her leg gone. But this, but because the ankle's the other way, it's almost like having another knee. She's able to kneel down and stuff. So um, the the next slide though talks, I think, about her uh, her uh, prosthesis, which uh, you know, seven months of healing and therapy and. Uh, and she knew she was ready for a new leg. And like she says, I pestered, begged, and did cartwheels every time I came to the clinic to convince them to give me a leg. And you know, like she said, two-legged people can't possibly know how much they take their legs for granted. When I finally got my new leg, I was so happy; it felt like a miracle. And that's a picture of her at I want to say 19, 18 or 17. And you know, she again, she won the state title with her high school team on a prosthesis as the outside hitter. Uh, she was a Gene Autry Gino Courage Award winner in 2004, a member of the first Paralympic sitting team, and also the one that won the silver medal in, uh, in Beijing. Um, she was the Cosmopolitan magazine Fun Fearless Female in 2006. So, you know, she she hasn't been denied anything. She's if you've ever if you meet Laura, she's just not only stunningly beautiful and charming, but she's just a great inspiration for everything. She's got a one and a half year old now, um, lives in uh, New York. And uh, is currently on this uh, this Paralympic team, and I love that quote. She said, "Every everyone used to say how sorry they were for me, but I'm thinking, how can I be sorry? I'm going to the Olympics because of this, you know." And that's just her mentality. So she's an amazing young woman. Agreed. And um, the resource CD that, if you're listening and you've never seen it or heard about it, we can just email MVP at usav.org or email info at usav.org and we'll get it to you but we have uh, some great footage of Laura playing for her bronze medal and you can see 
a match point comes up, uh, her serving with her ankle flipped around so it can be a good knee. And, and she is a tremendous role model. I'm looking forward to watching her play, and I'll take some pictures of her, I'm sure, um, when I'm in London. Uh, when I, cause I don't get to do control committee when the U.S. team is playing, I've got to keep my... Uh, myself off of the control committee then and they're ranked number two in the world so I'm hoping to not have to uh, I hope and not have to be on control committee during the gold medal match but instead I can sit back and watch <laughs> yeah. and, we've got and the to Paralympic play. Games there the 29th through the 9th so you know I, I think they're going to be showing some on YouTube right correct John? you know they're, they're, we're not sure what's coming down but we do know this so I'll give you a if you're listening to this after September 9th sorry but um, GBC Channel 4 is going to show 24-7 on the Paralympics. And there are programs such as Tunnel Bear that allow you to, for $5 a month, get unlimited tunnel access so that your computer gets seen to be coming from someplace else other than the United States. And that allows you then to watch the BBC channel. and. There's other programs um, out there. If you really need to know where it is, uh, you know, send me an email at john.kessel at usav.org. But uh, the whole final, if, if we do get it broadcast, we'll be posting it, highlighting it. I'll be doing a daily blog from London, but we'll be hyping it up. And, and we're really hoping that Laura comes back with uh, some success for sure. All right, so your last slides are some guiding principle stuff between Hugh and Karch and Paula. Yeah, so the women's national team, and I think I think a lot of the men's national team would agree with this stuff too, but this, you know, their guiding principles basically came down to these three things, and that was repeatability, so keeping things simple, uh, motion simple. I know I talked to Nicole um, after her first few weeks with Hugh, and she had been taught by Toshi and then Jenny Long Ping, and there was a lot of extra movement in her passing, and she really, really, you know, kind of kicked and bucked a little bit, um, you know, and Hugh got her to try to change things. And um, but literally four, three or four months after, and she was kind of really bought into what Hugh said. I talked to her, and she said, "I can't believe I did it the other way. It was just so it's so much simpler this way, and so much easier. And it's, you know, it's just it makes it easy to repeat, like she said. And so that's one of the things they talk about. And I and I will say, Eric, right? um, one of the bravest things I've ever seen a coach do was at the HP clinic in front of 200 coaches and, and Hugh was just appointed woman's head coach or chose to be that. And he talked to Davis about this and, and in front of the coaches performed drills and stayed on her and guided her to do that. I, I just thought that was an amazingly brave and yet at the same time it's proof of the consistency that what he was saying that very, very first day I'm sure didn't change a bit and you saw Davis start to get the idea as time went on. Yeah, yeah, and that's absolutely true. It was, it was brave of her too. I mean, she got out there and was as, you know, vulnerable as anybody on that court. So, and and so the second thing, of course, is reducing variance, making cleaner mechanics, and reading the game, and, and trying to make sure that you know when you run a certain play, it's run the same way every single time, every single time. And so they work on that constantly. They Nicole refers to it as, as you know just taking out wrinkles, just, just you know, fixing the wrinkles. Um, that sounds like a mechanism to me, but uh, you know. It, Again, constantly. That's most of them. Just reduce the variance and, and make things absolutely the same every time. They run. And a lot manage risk. That's a huge part of you know volleyball at that level is not making silly mistakes and not making the bad mistakes. And, and there are little things. There are no little things. And so Nicole says, "I am always working on ways to get better." And so what? She says, I am always working on... Yeah, and so, like I said, I've got, you know, Nicole's been, this will be her, this is her second Olympics, and uh, 
uh, as a libero, and you know Nicole. I've known her for a while. If you don't know, if you don't know Nicole, first of all, she's about. I think she's listed at five four, but maybe she's five two. Maybe um, she was a judo kid and started playing volleyball her freshman year, maybe sophomore year of high school. And before it was known, this little five foot two, five foot three girl was one of the best outside hitters in California. And uh, you know, for Nicole, she um, you know she she loves the sport. She's enjoyed it. But she's always, I mean, literally always working in ways to get better. And so as the next slide attests to, you know, she yeah, was in the Italian it's, it's, this year. She had signed on to play professional Italian. And, um, and and she went to the, she, you know, she played, and then she, the next night she would go to the men's matches because she wanted to figure out what the men were doing. And she said, you know, the Italian league for the men is probably one of the best in the world. The men take float serves with their, you know, with their face, you know, overhand. They take them with their, their hands above their head. Um, which they don't do in the women's game for the most part. And she said, you know, the trajectory and the speed's a little different in the women's game, but with our net being lower, the float serve is also way more prominent. So she, her whole thing was, I need to figure out a way to get better at this. And so she did. She's like she said, I've tried to incorporate more overhead passing in my service seed game. I watch a ton of video on myself as well, you know, and uh, she spends a lot, a lot of time trying to get better. And what I didn't have in here and what her and I have been talking about since is that, She's she's also gone to or going to um, someone that works with her thought process, um, actually using her brain waves and, and figuring out when she gets you know if she if she messes up a play she gets very anxious. Well, does that hang with her or is she able to relax out of it? And like she told me, you know, I've never been good at that. It's been something I've had to work with. Sometimes I'll make a mistake and it stays with me, and I'll make another mistake. And, but she's gone. And again, this was something that she wanted to do to get better. And she's worked on, re, you know, reducing that anxiety. She's worked on, you know, getting through her good, her bad moments and, and keeping her good moments going forward. And again, that's just a testament to her. And I think the next slide um, summed it up after. I was done. Yeah, it's up, it's up on everybody's that. screen but yours for some reason. That. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, she says, yeah, she says, this has never been easy for me, and I feel like I have to work harder than everybody here. And so just to give you an example of the practice I was at, um, I got there at around 7.30 for an 8 o'clock practice. She was already sweating. She had already taken serves from some of the people that got up there early. Um, practice, they had two liberos on she did not give a quarter three and a half hours, and when she's done, I give her a to talk to some coaches, and she looked Destiny and Megan, and I think it was Jordan, maybe it was, maybe it was Fluke, off to his side and asked her to serve them 150, I'd serve 150 more. And after that, she texted me, said, you know, we were talking about some other stuff, and she texted me, said, I'm going to go to now. That was her one day, was getting there at some practice, taking another 150 extra balls after practice, and then going to weights. So that's the kind of work that she's put in, and that's why she's Olympian. That's why, you know, she's she's hopefully going to win a gold medal. All right. Um, so we had a slide about the U.S. Men at Norseka, and, and using that, you've got some other Never Stop Learning examples. So tell us about those uh, videos that we're going to have to let people click and look at. One, yeah, I want to say that the top one, I think. Eric, we've lost you. You've lost me? Can you hear me? Hello, hello? Yeah, you're there, but hello, you're hello? incredibly faint. Okay, well, um, I'll talk louder than I guess. Um, the first one I Well, I don't know where Eric's gone. He may have gone into Cyberland. Um, we're not hearing it at all for some reason, Eric. So I'm going to move forward on this. Um, there are some things here to take a look at, like the talent code, um, our Glow of the Game blog and, and the technical posters alone up on FIVB, let alone some of these film clips that Eric's listed, are really good examples of the things that you can do in your downtime to get even better as a teacher of the game. Um, Eric, are you back? 
Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, just yeah, go ahead. I was just talking about the talent code for amazing little blog. Um, I think the top one, little interview that John Wooden did, um, the third one down is uh, just your blog. I, I just, again, I, I can curse there. Coach. Yeah, we've lost you again. Go the bottom and work your way up to those blocks. How many do you have now? Is it a couple hundred? Um, you know, we've got about 150, and um, they've been reposted to the uh, new website with some of the pictures. And the coolest thing is I've got an intern who's working on sorting them into coaches, parents, and players sections, and everybody section. And we're going to put it all into, like, a book. Um, so you can download the whole thing all by itself and then watch it at any point or read it at any point in time. So that's a, an upcoming thing for this fall for sure. But, um, you know, Eric, you've been with us here doing some great things for years and years. Um, outreach is a, is a perfect fit for you. Uh, we're lucky to have you with the Grassroots Commission for sure as our chair. And any closing thoughts that you might want to share with everybody that's listening in live? Um, we can take questions, but uh, I think Eric's done a hell of a job of answering things. But any last words you want to share, Eric? Now that you've been on the road and the team is playing, you presented this to Arizona before the team had even started to show how good they're playing. So what are your thoughts on that? Of course. Yeah, I presented it in June. You know, it's just great. I mean, to walk through my tour and got to see the people in Chapel, you know, it's, it's, I couldn't be happier for them. And like I said, when to hard work, knowing that was a they deserve the fact that we have Well, we seem to be losing you still. I know that you can hear me, but I think you're on a Florida Florida wireless. Everybody's come back to the hotel and is now watching uh, NBC Olympics live or something. I don't know what's going on, but um, thanks a million for your help with growing the game, not just in Arizona, but in every state that you're touching this summer and around the United States. Your work has been very much appreciated. Um, feel free to pass this webinar along to anybody. If you need a, a CAP uh, module credit, you can let us know that you've attended this and let the CAP Coaching Accreditation Program of USA Volleyball uh, confirm that you have and you can get credit for taking this uh, session with Eric. Fantastic stuff, Hudson. I really appreciate it more than I can tell you. Thank you, sir. Go back to the get some sleep and then get back in the gym. <laughs>